Um, Fred, let's start with you. Obviously, when all this was going on, you were just a gleam in, in the captain's eye. Did you kind of grow up dandling on your dad's knee hearing stories of Johnny Moped and, and the Croydon scene? Not in the slightest. <laughs> uh, I never heard of Johnny Moped until four years ago uh, when my dad took me to a Crystal Palace football game and we met Johnny afterwards. And that was where the story of the tattoo and all of those kind of... I heard them and I thought, oh, that would be a great thing maybe in the future to archive to get those stories, they're quite funny. Um, and that was, yeah, that was really it. That was how I first heard about it, yeah. And were you a filmmaker? Uh, yeah, I mean, like I, that, I'd finished film school at that point, so I had a little handy cam and actually filmed bits and pieces of them at that period in time, yeah. And, and Ray, when Fred came to you and said, I think I want to make a movie about this, and uh, you're going to be in it, and uh, how, how did you feel about all that? Well, um, the Johnny Moped story does, I, I think it needs to be told because, uh, you know, especially in this day and age of manufactured music, um, you know, the, 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 we were so inept and we just weren't doing it for a commercial reason. I mean, we had, we had no chance, really, and, but we were just having a good time. So I just think it's a, a, an example. Um, young bands say to me, you know, got any advice? I just say, you've got to enjoy it. And, you know, any success that comes, just, you know, take it if, if it happens. But if it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter anyway because, you know, it's better to play a guitar than sit at home and watch TV, you know, apart from, you know, Fred's movies, of course. <laughs> <laughs> well, like I uh, said in the movie, the, you know, the worse you, the worse you were, the better it was. How great is that? You know, you can't do any better than that. And it, it, you know, it's interesting, all the trouble they had was in part because of Johnny, but they wouldn't have been a band. There wouldn't have been Johnny without Johnny. You can't see, you know, obviously as skilled as they are, you can't see Slimy Toad and Dave Burke having a band and just and, and it achieving even the level of success that Johnny Moped did. I mean, he's really a one-off. Yeah, he's just, he's just got so much charisma, uh, um, you know, uh, on and off stage. Uh, the, the thing is, um, you must have found this, Fred, when you, when you interviewed him or you took him down the pub or whatever, you can't stop the bloke talking, can you? He's just like, he's just like non-stop and just so entertaining. He's got a, um, a point of view on every subject. And uh, yeah, he's Actually, just... That was the first thing that... The first time I ever... I just sat down with him because I wanted to just test it out, see if I could get... You know, if it was possible to do an interview with him. And I sat him down in the pub after a few drinks and my dad had given me a list of questions, but they were all ridiculous questions. Like, <laughs> what were they? Like... Like bludgeons and oh yeah, that was a, uh, that was another thing that we used to do. We used to deliberately uh, break a string or, or or a drum skin or something like that, so that Johnny would have to make a speech on stage, and you'd uh, you'd, you'd give him a crumpled piece of paper he put in his pocket and he'd pull it out. He'd never seen it before. He'd say um, ad lib ad lib around you know baby seals <laughs> or um, bludgeons or something like that, and he'd he'd say right. Uh, Ad lib around babies, and then he'd, he'd come out with like five minute kind of um, spiel. It's just genius. I mean, some of it, you know, um, has ended up on Roxy album and stuff like that. The blood, yeah. what is a bludgeon all about? You know what I mean? It's, uh, <laughs> and, the, and then there's a misogyny the song, as well. Yeah. You know, you have to, I mean, uh, some of those lyrics are uh, hysterical. Uh, I mean, you have to ask. Uh, slimy Toad should be up here answering questions on that stuff, really. He's the, he's the one to defend the, the misogynistic. Yeah, kind of, yeah, 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 I never quite nice. got that. <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, you yeah. know, he'll only ever do a gig within a kind of 15-mile um, radius of, uh, of Coulston. <laughs> so it's his fault. I was going to take it up with the, with the people here about why isn't Johnny Moped playing? Why don't we have a gig here? But it's, they're, they're, just too, they're just too local. The, the rule is nowhere further north than Camden <laughs> and nowhere f further south than Brighton and nowhere further east or west of London. So it's kind of like this little strip. I mean, r rumor has it they've taken his passport as well. So he that was yeah. There's lots of vicious rumors about the, her. her family. You know, I mean, they, don't they, tell me the mother-in-law is still alive. <laughs> well, no, there's you know more family than that, and and I mean Johnny's got his job and he, he does it well. But you well, know, he's he's now a carer. Like when I first started making the film, and it's not in the film. There's a lot of things that couldn't be put in the film. But he was actually working in Asda when we first started making the film. And he, was, he had a full-time job there, stacking shelves in Asda. And he lost his job, actually, from 
stealing a block of cheese, kind of whilst we were doing it. Like that was it, apparently it's the trumped up charge. I don't know, but that's one of the it things was, that happened. It was just a you know a, a tray of like little bits of cheese that for 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 the public to try to sample. And apparently he had a, a little bit of cheese and the security guard said, right, you're coming to the manager's office and they booted him out on that trumped up charge, which is kind of sad. But he used to come to gigs. I mean, I did a gig uh, in Croydon with a, a put-together band called Dead Men Walking, which uh, um, very, I mean, we used to have guests jump up on stage with us and Johnny arrived you know, straight from Asda into the dressing room. So going to get him up to do a couple of rock and roll songs because that's what his love is you know, you know. Uh, so he's going to get him to do um, Little Queenie or something else and um, he didn't he only had, he only had his Asda uniform so we borrowed a leather jacket off someone and a pair of jeans off someone else but then we looked at his shoes and it's just like really awful kind of you know straight kind of uh, footwear and um, we thought ah oh, I, I had this brainwave. What if we had him go on like Sandy Shaw did in the 60s with no shoes on, you know, barefoot? Uh, we, just, we regretted that as soon as he took them off. <laughs> they stank the whole bloody theatre out. I mean, they could smell it at the back. <laughs> Very rock and roll. Uh, I'm sure we have some questions for Fred and Ray. Yeah, this, I mean... Yeah, thank God for Don Letts, my God. This, yeah, there's all too little footage of that time, and yeah, well it done, was, that man. It was, it was amazing, like, um, actually, the stuff with Chrissy Hind in it of the Roxy Club was filmed by a guy from Sheffield, actually, called uh, Simon Holland. He's an editor now, but he made this punk film called Apathy for the Devil in 78. Oh, no, it must have been 77, because it was the Roxy. And it was just... He, he got in touch with me and said, I've got some footage of the Roxy Johnny Moped. And I saw it, and it was these, it was four very brief shots. But Chrissy Hind was in two of them, you know, it was like, oh my God, this is amazing, this is perfect. Because there was like literally nothing else apart from that. And so it's things like that, those bits of archive that kind of I've structured the film around that have really made it, you know, like that's, it, I, I, you know, I was just really lucky that there's so much. Stuff, yeah, just enough really to be able to make that tell that story. A lot story. of people were yeah. just were picking up cameras and doing like what Don said, and there were other people who were shooting, yeah. uh, who were shooting things at that time. Yes. Um, I just want to say I would love to see a guy in an ASDA uniform leading a punk rock band. <laughs> we we should have let him keep it on actually, <laughs> rather than getting the. Very, it's very punk rock. <laughs> <laughs> A strategic rip, maybe. Uh. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah, because of the cheese incident, he, he was fired, and now he's the, the carer for Brenda. So that kind of, that passed, and that, it, there was just wasn't really a chance to put that into the film, because the way, we, you know, it was quite a brief thing, having them at the end. So, yeah. Anything else? Oh yeah, um, several times I think I'm I'm a little bit blurry on stuff uh, for some reason or other, um, possibly to do with uh, substance abuse and and blah blah blah. But uh, yeah, I mean Johnny was, yeah, I mean it, it was the same kind of bag really, you know. Um, although that you know Brian James from the Damned, uh, he ran a tight ship and. Uh, he did. He didn't really appreciate us um, getting too out of lunch, out to lunch. In fact, our, uh, his girlfriend used to come downstairs uh, when we staying in hotels and that. Um, his girlfriend would sit there and uh, tell us a wag her finger at us. And you, Mr. Scabies, you were last night. You were blah 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 and all this sort of thing, you know. And um, I thought well, that's not very punk rock. Yeah, it must have been something for you to go from. Gordon and Johnny Moped to that, not just because of the sudden, the instant success, but because suddenly, you know, uh, being on time was <laughs> was a priority, like being able to being able to play suddenly was a priority. Yeah. Uh, the thing about being in a band is, uh, I mean, I, I, I can't get up in the morning. And uh, it was it was we were really lucky that he came today because 
Um, he didn't yeah. realise that the train was 10.55 from St Pancras, not from Brighton. And so he had to get up and get a train at nine, which he I was not at, happy I about was up at, at six this morning. I was. <laughs> but, um, the, yeah, the, the thing is, uh, yeah, you, I come alive in the evening and... Um, oh, sorry, I can't remember what the question was. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I could go back to pretty much the, the archive footage that my dad put, the home movies of me as a kid, and I'm telling him off for, you know, being real, really immature and teasing me about needing the toilet and whatever, you know, like, there's footage of me, we're at the Bluebell Railway, and I'm walking along, I'm like really desperate for the toilet, and he's like, you know, just singing songs at me and just winding me up, and teasing, yeah, so I'm the serious one, and he's the child, yeah. <laughs> And you used to run, run around, didn't you, chasing members of uh, whatever band I was in at the time uh, with, if they were smoking outside. Um, you used, to, used to come out with a pint of water and yeah, that's true, yeah. put the fire out. And uh, what did you call... We were on the phone to Paul Gray today and he reminded you of the name you used to call him. I can't remember. Pa pa Paul Gray the Turd. Or something like that, yeah. <laughs> so your rebellion... Your rebellious teenage years were to be as anti-punk rock as you could, to be yeah, like totally yeah, pretty straight. Much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least you didn't join the army, you know. <laughs> <laughs> How long did it take you to make the film from, you know, having the idea to filming it? And just can you explain the process of how, you know, where you got the funding and how you made it? There is no funding whatsoever in the film. And I made, I did everything myself, and it took three years, pretty much. So, thank you very much. <laughs> and at the moment in time, we are ad attempting to recoup the. No, well, we're trying to make some money by selling, pre-selling DVDs and things like that. To what well, we were about to start, so that we can pay for the archive and all that kind of thing, because we've got all these <laughs> bills that we need to pay for to be able to release the film. Um, but yeah, we literally just did it and just made it and just I did it in my spare time and I pulled in a lot of favours and a lot of people helped me out for free and uh, yeah no, was, well uh, done uh, yeah <laughs> as soon as I heard you know the in, in drum intro to uh, New Rose I thought uh, Brian James <laughs> that, that'd be like 75 pounds 23p or whatever a and you've got to pay the pretenders and uh, all sorts of... Well done for not playing the Sex Pistols, though. <laughs> <laughs> they don't deserve a penny. Well, they don't. I mean, you know... I mean, look, the difference between Johnny Rotten and Johnny Moped is evident for all to see, isn't it, really? You know, Johnny Rotten, for all the kind of... Oh, I, I, blah, blah, blah. blah. I mean, really, the bloke's actually saying nothing whatsoever, you know, and he's not, you know. Yeah, it should have had Johnny Moped to do the butter ads. <laughs> or, or, or the TV show with the bugs. Yes. <laughs> did um, did Johnny take any convincing or any of the other guys up to, to, to participate in the film? Oh my to, like, god! Go along with this? It was actually, you know. When you're with Johnny and you're filming with him, he's brilliant and he's really up for doing it and he's a lovely guy and I had a lot of fun, you know, kind of doing that stuff. But actually getting him to do things, to actually turn up to do interviews <laughs> or anything like that. You know, the whole first half of making the film, we had to do it in different locations because we weren't allowed to go to Johnny's house because Brenda was not going to be happy with it and Johnny didn't want to, you know, risk being told off or anything like that. So we did the first interview at Jacko, the bass player's house. And the... The, oh God, what was the question? Like, how was it? Like, there was one time that I went there and I just, I needed some footage of Johnny doing some stuff. So I went there in, with the kind of aim to just film him walking down the street in catering, getting, buying the newspaper or whatever, just whatever I could get, really. And we, I turned up and I couldn't get hold of him. And I was ringing his mobile and there was no answer. And I was kind of... Pretty, scared, pretty nervous. I didn't want to go over and knock on the door because I know, knew that he wasn't going to be happy. I knew that Brenda was going to be happy. So I phoned up Slimy Toad, who also lives in Caterham, and he, he just said, stop being a pussy. Just go over there. What's the worst that can happen? Go and knock on the door. So I, I did that, and Johnny answered, and then he ended up just inviting me in, and I ended up getting all of that footage that was at the end of the film, really. They invited me in. I spent the whole day with them. You know, I had a nice, nice time with them. They were totally open. 
they let me take whatever family photos I wanted to take. They just, you know, like, we're going, you can use these and all this kind of thing. And the Johnny and Brenda singing, you know, that was, I think that whole section at the end was really, really important. And it was just so lucky that I got it because, you know, I just had to have the balls to knock on the door, really. And in some ways, uh, you know, we were talking earlier about the uh, Johnny Cash movie, um, you know, and I, I got some, you know, sometimes Hollywood focuses too much on the relationship, you know, and forgets about the actual, you know. I mean, Johnny Cash was a was a maniac. He was like sort of, you know, anti-establishment kind of, you know, uh, he was in prison. He, was, he did all this great stuff, but all they were t talking about was Carleen Carter and, you know, and all this. And But you could have easily focused on the Johnny and Brenda thing because, I mean, that is quite a love story, really. I mean, it's amazing. You know, you told me uh, earlier that you'd go around and sit there. I mean, uh, they watch soap operas and stuff yeah. in the art. They watch daytime TV all, all day. That's Johnny's role as a carer. You know, there's, a, there's another woman who comes over who kind of looks after Brenda. Like, like you know, she would come over every day and bathe, you know, wash her and do all that kind of thing. Johnny's role is to cook food and kind of just sit, sit watching daytime TV with her all day. And so, you know, actually when I've been over there recent times for a drink with him, he's just been like, oh, thank God, you know, like, <laughs> I really needed to get out of the house kind of thing. Well, but, she's, she's got this fearsome reputation over yeah. all these years of like being sort of, you know, the, the thing that stood in everybody's way. Yeah, exactly. But, you know, actually, there is, you know, like you're saying, that there is a real love story for it. He obviously yeah. really loves her, and he's been with her for all this time. And I mean, what's more important, the band or, or that, really? But I do remember uh, trying to persuade her to let him, you know, come and do gigs and stuff. And uh, she chased me down Croydon High Street, banging me over the head with her handbag at one point. <laughs> I had to run into the, uh, the, honestly, I had to run into the police station to get away from her. And she was standing there down the steps waiting for me to come out. And the, the police was saying, what? Can we help you? <laughs> I'm being beaten up by this 40-year-old well, woman. <laughs> yeah. I, th I think it's just because, like, you know, I, I did it as this kind of just side project, just doing something um, because I wanted to make a film and I thought these stories were great. But there's just so many people along the way that I've met that just absolutely, you know, they love Johnny Moped and they wanted to tell the story and they were all just so open. that So everybody I met were just, yeah, just really up for doing that, really, and being involved. I got so many pictures, so many things just sent to me that people were just like, yeah, please have these, please use these, and all of that kind of thing. So, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it was pretty nice. Thank you. <laughs> I, I can't wait until the film's seen in, uh, in America and they get a load of our teeth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is, just out of curiosity, is there anybody here who ever saw Johnny Moped? Has the record? I heard it. Yeah, we got one in the front. You got a story to tell? <laughs> He's his own story. Yeah, he really had a, an element, too, of like the hillbilly cat. I mean, when he's, you see him young and he's gorgeous and he's got that pout. I mean, he's really got, you know, you mentioned Johnny Cash. He's got that, that Memphis in the 50s kind of streak to him. There's a little element of that in punk rock and the stripped back stuff. But, I mean, it's like it, there was not the self-awareness of some of the, yeah, of, you know, someone like Shane McGowan, for example. Um, he was just doing the shit he did. Yeah, um... You know, I'd, uh, it was never going to succeed, was it? But um, it was good fun. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, I feel, I do, you know, I've, I, I must say, I have an element of guilt, you know, jumping ship and, and doing the damned and happy talk and all that sort of stuff because, but, but then again, you know, they did magnificent stuff without me anyway, you know. But the lyrics might have been less misogynist. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
<laughs> if I'd stayed. <laughs> It's a really tiny archive question, because um, I was sort of around all that time, and it's really hard for us, like I came from Reading, there's like a big punk scene around there, there's no, there's hardly any photos, there's no footage, people didn't have access to that equipment, so I was really curious, who shot the back garden gig, yeah, and what was it shot on, have you got any idea? Yeah, it was, sh it was shot by, you know, Fred, who was the bass player who died, um, it was filmed by his brothers, but they were doing it for Dave, the drummer, I think. So it was like, I think Dave's family must have had a Super 8 camera or something. And why they only filmed that particular one and nothing else to do with the band, I have no idea. But they recorded the sound as well um, on you know, a proper reel-to-reel -reel tape player and stuff. So it was, yeah, amazing. It was absolutely amazing to have that. That was really an important thing, I think. Succeeded, and why the group of Johnny Mumford did not? <laughs> that's, because that's for I, you. I'm a big, big fan of the Pogs, so um, I would like to know. I'm a bit deaf. Sorry. Um, that was, was that why? Why did the Pogs yeah. Yeah. succeed? Why did the Pogs succeed and not yeah. Johnny Mumford? Crikey, that's a good one. Um, well, they they had good tunes. Johnny Mumford had good tunes. Shane was kind of out there and. Johnny, I don't know, really. It's a, that's a good one. Maybe um, the Pogues had less offensive lyrics, <laughs> believe it or not. <laughs> yeah. I got kicked off stage. <laughs> yeah. They, they yeah. also had a singer who wanted to make it, and Johnny never particularly wanted to make it. He, he had a band that wanted him to be the front man, so I guess that there was no drive there. When you think? Yeah, Shane's a funny one, really. I mean, he was there right at... The, I mean, the, I think the first time I really noticed him was at a Clash gig at the ICA in uh, just off Pall Mall in London, and uh, he had his ear bit, uh, his earlobe bitten off, and it got in sounds of one of the... And it was a it was, I think it was a tabloid or something. Or yeah, it was a really good moment, but I remember the way he talked at the time, because he was just out of Westminster School or one of these public schools or whatever, and it was, oh, yeah, it's so jolly good, this punk rock, and <laughs> the next thing you know is uh, he's t speaking like sort of a really strong Irish brogue, you know, because he joined a different kind of band. So, well, uh, good luck to him. <laughs> but that's a true story. Probably had his teeth pulled out purposely just so he would sound a certain way. <laughs> yeah. The other amazing thing about this that you really should know, um, this is kind of, I don't know, you know, it concerns Fred here, was um, when the other Fred um, bumped himself off. Fred, how old are you? Oh, yeah, you, were, yeah. you were I mean, this days is really old. spooky. I was, I was born... 13 days before Fred committed suicide. And my parents happened to call me Fred without realizing, you know, they hadn't been in touch, I guess, with Fred for a while. And they happened to call me Fred at the very same time that he committed suicide. And it we was just this weird thing. And then, what was it about Dave and Xerxes turning up at the house? Yeah, like that? we had no idea that um, Fred had killed himself. And me and Rachel um, were spending mom. ages. Uh, trying to decide on a name. I and was then it's Boris for the first month of my well, life, which, yeah. thank God, they came up with something else. <laughs> and, the, and then it came to us, Fred, you know. And, and um, we, we, named, we named you Fred, did the thing down a um, register or whatever it was you have to do. And um, then there was a knock on the door the next day, and it was, um, it was Xerxes and Dave Burke uh, from the Mopeds. And uh, they said... Um, we come to you, talk to you about Fred. And we said, oh, you've heard, have you? Um, you heard the good news. Yeah, we named him Fred. And they, they didn't know what I was talking about. And they had come to tell us that Fred, the bass player, had killed himself. Incredible, isn't it? Just bizarre, you know? There must, it must be some psychic kind of reason. I'm not that way inclined, but, you know... So, you know, there's a lot of these things. Talk to Uri Geller. He was here a few minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> figured all this out. Fraud. <laughs> we have time for one more question. Yeah, um, I just wanted to know what the rest of the band are doing now. Um, Xerxes and, uh, and Slimy. And there, there, was a, there was a good argument for having that in the film, and it just didn't quite work, you know, having their, what they're doing now. But um, I, what does Dave do now? 
He worked for the gas board for a while until it was cha changed name or got privatised or whatever. Um, then the slimy toad, I don't know what he does. He, I, I filmed with him actually. Um, he does something to do with crates, like driving crates around, um, picking up crates and taking them. Pallets, that's right, Pallets, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, the weird one though is Xerxes, who disappeared um, he's an, he's no quite, spy. A, quite early on. Yeah, we, we have this theory he's a spy because I. Whenever I go abroad or whatever, he kind of turns up and he says, oh, I've been living here for a free... You know, I was in Prague or whatever, and uh, I've been living here for like three months or something. What, what are you doing? He said, I can't say, you know. <laughs> I might have to bump you off. Um, but he always knows the best pub, so. <laughs> All right, well. Okay. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for the film, Fred. Thank you for everything you've done, Captain. <laughs> and thanks for coming down. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you for the good.